Well, welcome to the Mathematical Institute and our talk, uh, Love and Math. I think there's something quite exciting about seeing signs pointing towards the Maths Institute saying, Love and Math, this way. Um, so um, uh, I hope you're not all expecting sort of group hugs or anything like this, but there'll be lots of exciting maths and love of maths. Um, so we're very excited. This is part of uh, a wonderful conference that's been going on for the last few days, looking at lots of interactions between uh, different areas of mathematics, uh, looking at uh, symmetry and correspondences. And uh, uh, Professor Edward Frankel is going to be talking about one of the most exciting correspondences um, in mathematics, uh, something called the, the Langlands program. Um, so the, the idea for the next hour is that uh, Edward's going to kick off, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the subject of his book, which is called Love and Math, the mathematical story at the heart of that book. Um, then we're going to be in conversation for a short while, and then I will open up the floor for you to join in the conversation and uh, pose some questions to Edward and uh, about uh, the book and mathematics and love. Um, but anyway, it's a great pleasure to have Edward um, here, Professor of Mathematics at the University of Berkeley and author of this wonderful new book, Love and Maths. So over you to Edward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marcus, for such a great introduction. Can you guys hear me well? Um, yeah, it's, and it's such a great pleasure to be here at uh, Oxford University Mathematics Institute, uh, Henry Wiles building. It's a new building. It's the first time I'm here, and it's just so wonderful. I will have a very hard time leaving this place, so I might stay, stick around longer. And thank you all for coming. It's such a great pleasure to have you all here. I want to talk today about love and math. And so, as Marcus said, you know, um, you know, the, the arrow was pointing, you know, if you wanted to get some of that, so then you should come here. So yeah, now I have to show you something to convince you that there is a link between the two. So what I want to start with is, um, is this beautiful quote from Galileo he said, uh, the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics. And he said, without mathematics, one is left wandering in a dark labyrinth. So, so it kind of suggests that mathematics is a language. But what kind of language is it? Is it kind of a universal language, which means the same thing to everyone? Is there only one mathematics? This sounds a little bit abstract. So let's ask a slightly more concrete question. If we were to meet aliens, would aliens have the same math? And uh, you can imagine aliens like this, or it um, could be something else. But actually, you know, it's no longer just a subject of sci-fi movies. Uh, we now know that there are quite a few planets out there which could theoretically, in principle, support intelligent life. Like this one, which was found, Kepler-186f, an Earth-sized planet which was found recently. Uh, just a few months ago. And so, but what if intelligence does not take the form of those you know, little creatures that we usually imagine? What if it is a Solaris-like intelligence? You, some of you may have seen the old film of, uh, of Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris based on a novel of Stanislav Lem in which a whole planet w was sentient, was, uh, you know, was intelligent, and had, could interact with other creatures. So the question then would be, would Solaris-like intelligence have exactly the same math as we do? Because one could argue that perhaps not, because there is only one of it. There's not just one alien, two alien, three alien. There is only one Solaris. So would it, would it be able to discover numbers? And the point I'd like to make is actually, I believe that Solaris would discover numbers, but discover them in a different way. And this is an important point that Mathematics, there are, many, there are many different portals into the same concepts and ideas in mathematics. The mathematics is kind of uh, uh, unified. The different parts of mathematics are connected in unexpected ways. And this is a very good example. Count, uh, numbers could be discovered not necessarily by counting. You could also discover them through winding. And it's a simple experiment. You know, my, my dentist always insists that I do floss. I don't do enough of that. But I carry the thing with me, so I feel good about myself, you know. But actually, this is a very good example because when you do flossing, you actually wrap this thing, this thread on your, on your finger, and then you can count the number, in, the number of times that you wrap it around. And if you, if you wrap it, say, counterclockwise, then you count them as positive numbers. If there is no, no uh, winding at all, 
then zero and, and clockwise, negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. Now, one could say that this is actually, in some sense, a better way of discovering integers, the whole numbers, than by counting. Because, you know, when we teach our children numbers, we tell them, well, look, uh, you have one apple, two apples, three apples, and so on. But then they say, but these apples are different, so why are you combining them together? But windings are exactly the same, you know? So this is a, it's kind of a pure numbers. They are actually alike. So, going back to Solaris type intelligence, a Solaris type intelligence could discover in the same way big numbers because here we talk about wrapping you know, a thread, but also uh, a sphere could wrap on itself many times and with positive orientation, with negative orientation, as mathematicians say. And so this way, uh, uh, a Solaris would discover numbers through winding. This is what mathematicians call homotopy groups, it, and it's a portal into one very important area, a branch of mathematics. So mathematics really, to me, and this is a point which I, I, I try to convey in my book, Love and Math, is a kind of a hidden parallel universe, which is full of elegance and beauty and I intricately intertwined with our world. But it is a world of its own, a kind of a platonic reality. Um, of ideas to which we connect in some way and discover those truths. So the way I like to think about math really is kind of a jigsaw puzzle. So you have all these many different pieces and you try to assemble them into a meaningful picture, but you don't know what the picture, what the final image is going to look like. That's what doing mathematics is about to me. And so it becomes some, something like this. So you, you know, a kind of a jigsaw puzzle, but also you, I like to think of mathematics as containing this, you know, many different continents. And so, like, um, what are the continents of mathematics? One is number theory, the study of numbers. So we just talked about the integers, the whole numbers. But that's just the beginning, because once you study um, whole numbers, then you have fractions. Once you have fractions, then you can do things like square root of two. You realize it's not a fraction, so it's, a, it's, not a, it's an ir irrational number not because it's, it acts irrationally, but because it's not a, a, a ratio of two, number, of two integers. And, and then little by little you discover more and more. So that's the study of numbers. This is number theory. But there is another area of mathematics which is called harmonic analysis. That's another continent of mathematics. And harmonics, of course, we perceive the most, sort of, the most clear way when we listen to music. The sound of symphony is composed from the so sounds of different instruments. And every note can be thought of as a wave. And the wave can be represented as a, you know, as a kind of a graph of the sine, cosine function. And so these are the harmonics. These different sounds are harmonics. But then uh, we combine them together and uh, impose them upon each other. And together they combine into the beautiful sound of a symphony. So this idea, this is the idea that a general signal could be decomposed, could be broken into pieces, and pieces being this elementary harmonics. That's the idea of harmonic analysis, which has been very important and very uh, useful in, in mathematics. And so at the outset, the, these two continents of mathematics, the um, number theory and harmonic analysis, look totally different. But we now understand, although there were some connections found earlier, but um, this man, Robert Langlands, about 45 years ago, uh, a little more, came up with some groundbreaking ideas which connected these two different continents, these two different worlds of number theory and harmonic analysis, and much more. Here's Langlands, uh, is a picture of Langlands uh, taken in 1999 at his office at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Participants of, the, of this conference have seen this Langlands in this office on the first day, watching him give a talk exactly at this office, which, by the way, is the office which belong, used to belong to Albert Einstein. And actually, if you look at Einstein's, uh, some of the pictures of Einstein in his office, you will see the similarities, because many of the things are preserved the same way as, as they were on, uh, with Einstein. And so I, I often, um, you know, I make kind of a half a joke, I say that you know, everybody knows about Einstein and his relativity theory, and rightly so. But very few people know about Langlands. And I think that, but I think that, you know, the Langlands program, the work that Langlands initiated 45, 50 years ago, perhaps is just as important as relativity theory. And many more of us should know about it. And, uh, and, and perhaps it will yield applications just as important as Einstein's relativity. But first, let's talk about it. What is it about? So, there are many, many things and many parts in the Langlands program, and I talk about this in great detail in my book. 
Uh, but uh, I just wanted to focus on one particular aspect of it, which is a bridge, a connection between two different continents of mathematics. One is number theory, and the other one is harmonic analysis. And so to explain, uh, to, for, for non-specialists, I just want to say a couple of words here. Um, we look at what's called the clock arithmetic. If you start work at 9 in the morning and you work for 8 hours, when do you finish? Well, 9 plus 8 is 17, but we don't say 17, right? We say 5 o'clock. How do we get 5? We get 5 by subtracting 12 from 17. So 9 plus 8 is not 17 in this clock arithmetic, but 5. That's what we get, and we call it modulo 12, meaning that it's 5 up to, up to ad ad addition of 12, or it could be a multiple of 12, like 24 and so on. So this clock arithmetic is used not only in a cl on a clock with 12 hours, but it could also be used on a clock with any number of hours. <coughs> it could be 5 hours, 7 hours, 10 hours, and so on. But in mathemat mathematicians like to consider clocks in which the number of hours is the prime number. So it's a number which is not divisible by uh, a whole number, which is not divisible by any other whole number except for 1 in itself. So here are the first few, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. So here's a clock with 7 hours. That's what it's going to look like. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to look at equations and try to solve those equations using these new rules, using this numerical system of clock arithmetic. Okay? So for example, this kind of cubic equation is a good example. You have two variables, x and y, and you have an equation. So we will look for, for numbers x and y such that if you substitute into this equation, you, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. But we look for numbers, whole numbers, so that the, the equation is satisfied, but within this framework of clock arithmetic, so modular some prime number. So they are not equal on the nose, but they could be, but they're equal up to a multiple of this prime number p. And then we'd like to count the solutions. We count the number of such solutions. So, so here is a simple example. Let's say p is 5, and what are the solutions? So first of all, of course, if you put 0 and 0, 0 equals 0, that's fine. But, uh, and likewise, x is 1 and y is 0. But here is 1, x is 0, y is 4. Whoops, went too far. Um, it's, if y is 4, you get 16 plus 4, which is, which is 20. And x is 0, is just 0. So 20 is not equal to 0 in the normal sense. But it, it is equal, they are equal to each other, modulo 5, because 20 is divisible by 5. So 20 is 0 modulo 5. So we got us another solution then. And there is one more. So there are four solutions all together. That's the kind of problem that we study in number theory. And now, uh, you know, and it looks like a super esoteric problem, which has no con could not possibly have any connections to anything. But actually, you know, a year ago, we found out that exactly this kind of um, equations were used to, um, you know, to, to insert various weaknesses into encryption protocols. And so it was, of course, a big deal. And we still, there is still a fallout is continuing. We're still learning more and more of what was going on and how mathematics was used, and perhaps one could argue abused by the powers that be. Some really sophisticated, complicated mathematics. And my point is, it's exactly mathematics of cubic equations like that, um, modulo, modulo primes. So we c it's called elliptic curve cryptography. You can see the equations of this type. Uh, this is another example. It's called an elliptic curve. And you use them for encryption. I don't want to get too technical, but uh, there is some very special property of solutions of these equations that if you have two solutions, you can produce a third. This is what mathematicians call a group. And so that property is used to set up, uh, for example, pseudorandom number generators. And the efficiency of such a uh, generator is predicated upon the fact that the certain problem on this elliptic curve has, is very hard to solve. I mean, it will be impossible to solve even on a very sophisticated network of computers. It's called a discrete uh, logarithm problem. It doesn't matter at this point what exactly the details are. But I want to show you that I'm not uh, lying to you that here's a, here's a US government document. This is not classified, so don't worry. <laughs> we will not have to kill you afterwards. So. Um, <laughs> from July 1999, and see, the federal government recommended elliptic curves, elliptic curve cryptography. Here is another publication which became very notorious in the last year since the revelations about the NSA scandal came to light by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States. These are recommendations for random number generators, 
which in particular use elliptic curve. One of, this, one of the generators which they propose uses an elliptic curve. This is the algorithm, this is how it works. And it's a selection of an appropriate elliptic curve in appendix A1. So we turn pages and we get to appendix A1 and see here's the equation, y squared, x cubed, and there's some number b. This, this is an, uh, number b is given, I, I cut it uh, so that you could read. Modulo prime, and here's the prime, you see. This is the number of hours that uh, they have um, on their clock mm -hmm. to do this, cal to do this cal calculation, to do this, generate these prime numbers. So this is bread and butter of modern encryption. And these generators are all, all, all everywhere. They are used to run other algorithms for encryption. And now we know, and this actually came to light very, very soon after this NIST publication uh, was published in 2007, two Microsoft researchers said, look, there is a possibility of a backdoor there was no comment from NIST, from any other organization, but now we find out that perhaps that there was. And in fact, the, the, uh, a, a company, RSA Security, which was producing this, um, mm, these generators, they shortly after this information came to light, they told their clients to stop using those generators. And more recently, just two months ago, NIST finally dumped this random number generator without any comment, saying, yeah, we should not use it, perhaps. So, so that's the power of mathematics. This is where we live now. <coughs> we live in a brave new world in which a mathematical formula could be just as powerful as a nuclear bomb. Maybe the effect is not as visible, but it could be just as lasting. And I think it's very important for us as citizens of this brave new world to be aware of this. It doesn't mean that we have to know all the details of what's going on, but just understand the general context and how mathematics could be used and abused. This, um, there is a video I did. I, I don't want to talk more about this. There is a wonderful um, YouTube channel, Number File, which is um, run by um, Brady Heron, who is here in England in, in Nottingham. And uh, he has almost, now it's almost 1 million subscribers. So I highly recommend it. And he asked me to explain this. I did, we did a video in December in which I explained more details. If you're interested in the subject, that's where you can find more details. But uh, I wanted to use this quote. Georg Cantor, the great German mathematician, creator of the theory of infinity, said, the essence of mathematics lies in its freedom. In other words, you're free to do, there is a very small number of rules which you have to follow, but within those rules, you're free. You can let your imagination run wild, and you can go as far as you want. But I also want to sort of turn this around, and I want to say, and I think that the example we just considered lends support to this thesis, that where there is no mathematics, there is no freedom. But let's go back to the language program. So we're looking at the equations of this type, and then we look at, at solutions modular primes, but different primes, not necessarily five, but also five and seven, all of them at the same time. And for each of them, we try to find how many solutions there are, okay, for each prime. So here I compiled, for these specific equations, I compiled this list. So here's the prime, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13. Of course, it goes on to, in, 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 to infinity. And for each of these primes, uh, one can count the number of solutions. So for example, for p equal 5, we actually counted uh, earlier, there are four solutions. And now I want to form a number which is called a of p, p being a prime, which I'll just take p minus that number. So for example, here p is 2 and number is 4, so uh, is, you get 2 minus 4 is minus 2. So you subtract second colon number from the first colon number. So 3 minus 4 and negative 1. I hope I didn't make any arithmetic mistakes. Please tell me if I did. Um, but for, for example, 5, 5 uh, you get uh, 5 minus 4 is 1. So the number a of, a of 5 is 1, and so on. But it becomes more and more complicated. As the number grows, of course, it's going to be more complicated with more solutions. It grows more or less like p, but there is sort of a defect. This is what we are measuring. So the question is, what are these numbers? They look totally random. Doesn't seem to be any, so totally chaotic. Doesn't seem to be any organizing principle. Is there any way that we could produce those numbers? somehow from some very small number, you know, in a very simple direct way. And it turns out that we can. And this is a miracle. I think it's a miracle and it's a very good example of what the Langlands program is about. When I say that there is a, a hidden connections between two, two subjects, number theory and harmonic analysis, here is, how it, it, here is how it works. Harmonic analysis to the rescue. All of these numbers could be obtained as coefficients of one function. And you see this function, it looks it might look at first glance awfully complicated, but actually it's not. Because see, what you do is you take, you have a new variable, Q. it's a variable. It's like usually we take x, y, z, and so on, but now I want to use q because I used x and y before. So it's, we just like, in mathematics we use, 
we, are, we like to use Q in this context. Q is, an, is just a variable. And then we form this product, okay? So bear with me. So you take first Q, then you take one minus Q. You take one minus Q squared. You take one minus Q cubed, one minus Q to the fourth, and you square them. Then you also take Q to the 11, Q to the 22, Q to the 33, and so on. So one minus Q to positive number, and one minus Q to 11 times positive number, and all squared. Very easy. You can generate, you know, you can write a small one line of code which will generate this thing. And then you open the brackets in the usual way and you collect the terms with the same uh, um, degree of, of uh, power of Q. So for example, if you open those brackets, you will see that Q to the 5, the coefficient will be 1. Q to the 6 will be 2 and so on. So very easy. It's, it's, it's really a, a very simple rule how to generate all these numbers all at once. In other words, just one line contains them all, contains all these coefficients. And it turns out that the numbers we were looking for, solutions, numbers of solutions of this cubic equation, are actually all encoded here. Namely, this number we were looking for exactly the coefficient in front of uh, the corresponding power of Q. So you see, for example, remember for it's not number of solutions, it's rather this number, this, this, this uh, deficit, so to speak, the, uh, the discrepancy. So for example, for p equal 5, remember it, it was four solutions, so 5 minus 4 is 1. And so, and lo and behold, in front of q to the 5, you got 1. And so likewise, you know, for 7, you have 7 minus 9, it's negative 2. And lo and behold, you have minus 2 times q to the 7, and so on. So you can extract any number without doing any calculation with the cubic equation, you get this. This is what Langlois actually in another article, he said mathematics is about finding order out of seeming chaos. And this is what this does. It's sort of like kind of a source code for this cubic problem. But this function lives in the world of harmonic analysis. And that's what I mean by finding connections between the two. And so in fact, uh, for experts, the, I mean, the series actually converges for complex numbers less than one in absolute value. And we get a function on the unit disk, which is called the modular form of weight two. And, and it has beautiful properties with respect to some group of symmetries on the unit disk, which is depicted here. So uh, the values of this function are completely determined by its values on any of these curved triangles. So this is called, so Shibura Tanyama Wei conjecture is something which was proposed before Langlands by at different times by these three mathematicians, Shimur, Tanyama, and Bay. It could be viewed as a special case now of, uh, we can, in retrospect of the Langlands program. And it's really very important because uh, it was used to prove Fermat's last theorem. And of course now I'm especially happy to talk about this because we are now in the Andrew Wiles building and I think Andrew Wiles is here also. So, so this is perfect because he and Richard Taylor in 1995 uh, proved uh, Shimur, Tanyama, Bay conjecture. Um, in the most, in the, you know, in most cases, and um, even earlier, um, my colleague at UC Berkeley, Ken Ribbit, showed that that implied actually Fermat's last theorem. So it is a big deal. It's not just it's a, you know, Fermat's last theorem, 350 years. It took 350 years. So finally, we we know what what it was that uh, Fermat wanted to write on that margin. So. <laughs> You know, it was a Twitter-style proof, you know, so <laughs> I only have 140 characters. I have a beautiful proof, but I only have 140 characters to spare, so I'm sorry. Oops, I'm, I, I don't have more space. So, but now we have it, so. And, uh, but, and, and this, you could say that this is only one special case of the Langlands program. So in Langlands program, you have many, many fascinating, beautiful, miraculous results like this, which we're still trying to prove and understand. And there is a lot more. I'm kind of going a little over time because I'd like to talk to, have a chance to talk to Marcus and also uh, take your questions. But just say a couple of words that uh, the same cubic equation that we looked at, what we looked at solutions with modular prime numbers, you can also look uh, for solutions with values in real numbers or complex numbers. And uh, interesting thing happens with complex numbers, what you get is a beautiful picture like this, a torus, a, a surface of a donut, uh, Homer Simpson's favorite um, Riemann surface. There are other human surfaces as well with two holes, like kind of a Danish pastry or three holes like a pretzel and so on, right? And so there's this beautiful geometric theory which goes in parallel with the theory which we talked about, or which I, I talked about earlier. So Langlands program, what happened is in 1967, Robert Langlands, the man you saw in the picture earlier, wrote a letter to an eminent mathematician, uh, Andre Wey, in which he laid out these ideas. But since then, this idea is sort of took life of their own and propagated to many other areas of mathematics, geometry, representation, theory of Lie algebras and quantum groups, and quantum physics. And this is something most recent. Oops. Whoa. Look at that. <laughs> so I was unexpected. But uh, um, quantum, 
quantum physics. And this is interesting because for those of you who heard Langland's talk, he talked about what he called mirror symmetry. He was, and it was slightly disparaging. Disparaging was like, yeah, well, we still don't fully understand it. But th in that, on that sense, he's right. But I think it's a beautiful theory. Uh, I will talk about it, by the way, tomorrow at, at our conference at 1.30, and it will be more technical mathematical talk in which I, I will try to um, discuss this connection which emerged very recently between the Langlands program and what's called the electromagnetic duality. So they, they turn out to be very closely connected. And um, so I want to end by, you know, if there is one, only one thing you remember from this talk, I want, you remember, I want you to remember this picture of mathematics as a jigsaw puzzle and connecting these different continents of mathematics, you know. But for young people in the audience, and of course we're all young, but, you know, for younger people in the audience, um, when I was a student, it's, it, oftentimes it looked like all, all the major problems have been solved, and so what, what, what am I doing here, you know? But actually, the more you study this, the more you understand how little we know. So in fact, there is practically almost no, we know almost nothing. And so in that sense, it's such a, I hope that many of, many of you will come and, and solve some of those remaining problems. And so this brings me to this beautiful quote from Isaac Newton, who talked about this undiscovered ocean of truth. So that he, to himself, he said, appeared as a little boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst this great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. So let's go out and discover more of those truths. Thank you very much. I actually reviewed this book for, for Nature, and uh, I mean, one of the beautiful things about it, I think, is uh, first of all, just to be able to explain um, something like the Langlands conjecture. I mean, it's uh, one of our great unsolved problems and a real challenge to try and explain to a general audience what it's all about. But I think uh, your example is really that little seed showing just what an amazing connection between two completely different areas of mathematics. I mean, it's a bit like an archaeologist discovering patterns That's right. in two different areas. But, yes. but I think the other thing I really s said was great about this book in my review was these two narratives. One's a sort of mathematical narrative, but uh, you also write this very personal narrative of uh, you know how, how you became a mathematician and actually the um, first chapter starts off um, how does one become a mathematician there are many ways that this can happen let me tell you how it happened to me it might surprise you but I hated math when I was at school and that's quite a, a brave opening so how actually did you become a, a mathematician if actually at, at school you you hated it well as I realize now I did not hate math I hated what I thought math was what was taught to me as math. And at the very beginning of the book, I say, imagine an art class in which they teach you only how to paint fences and walls, but never show you the paintings of the great masters. And they say, that's all there is to art. So then, of course, you will say, I hate art, but you'll be just saying, I hate painting the fence, but you don't know that there is something else. And that's, and, so, and that's how it was for me. I didn't know there was anything beyond the kind of stuff that we studied at school. Which, if you think about it, the mathematics that we studied at school, uh, practically all of it is more than 1,000 years old. And I actually, honestly, I find it scandalous. And I also find, what I also find surprising is that I myself only realized that recently. So somehow we, we take so many things for granted. And we, we can't even imagine that it could, things could be done in a different way. But why not? So we, we study Euclidean geometry you know, which is 2,300 years old. And of course, Euclid was great. Uh, he, you know, Elements was a very important book because it was not just for geometry, but he sort of showed us the way of how we think about mathematics, how we prove mathematical theories, how we create theories. But also Homer, for example. I don't mean Homer Simpson. I mean Homer, you know, Odyssey, you know. So he, um, he laid the foundation, around the same time, laid the foundation of the Western canon of, of literature. And we study Homer, and we respect and love Homer. But we don't stop at Homer in our literature classes, right? We also read T.S. Eliot and Salinger and many others. So why is it that we don't study mathematicians? That we don't study any geometry beyond Euclidean geometry. Why don't we study Riemannian geometry, which is the little, little donuts and spheres and, and, and Danish pastry, and understanding the, that maybe you know, the two meridians on a, on a sphere always intersect, unlike parallel lines on a plane and things like that. So, but I can go on and on about this for, for hours. So going back to your question, so this, that, that's where I was. So, but because the subject is so abstract, we need someone, I think what, hap what we need is we need someone to guide us into this world of mathematics. And I was lucky when I was 
15 years old, there was someone who was a friend of my family. Uh, I lived in a small town near Moscow, and he uh, opened the door for me because I was interested in physics, in elementary particles. And he said, do you know how, how, how physicists came up with these ideas, with these revolutionary ideas about quarks and other particles? And I said, I didn't know. He opened the book, and he opened the book, and he showed me. And there were diagrams, which I had seen before, with, but without any explanation in popular books. But here there was clearly a coherent theory, and it was a mathematical theory with formulas and equations, which I couldn't understand. But it was clear to me that those were the glimpses of this hidden world, which was hidden from me. You know? And he said, you think what they teach you at school is mathematics? No, this is my yeah. And That's how it happened for me. So I would say my, you know, the reason I wrote this book in some sense is that, you know, this guy, by the way, his name, uh, Evgeny Evgenievich Petrov, and I kind of wanted to make it sound a little bit like Russian novels, you know, like when you read War and Peace and so on. You had all, all these patronymic names, but he is, this is his real name. So I would like to be Evgeny Evgenievich for my readers, you know, in some sense, maybe to help them to open this door, to open the portal. And I imagine you, you know, Marcus, since you have written how many? Three, at least I know three of three yes, yes. very successful books. I imagine that you have, you have to grapple with this yep. uh, issue as well of how do you convey these ideas in an accessible way. But I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's interesting, you know, why did you decide to write this book? Because, you know, we're mathematicians. We spend a lot of time sort of uh, at conferences talking to our fellow mathematicians. And actually, you know, one of the books that, I mean, I had a similar experience where a teacher at school um, took me aside and said, you should find out what maths is really about, because it's not what we're doing in the classroom. Exactly. So I think probably all of us as professional but, but mathematicians... But some of us are not so lucky. Uh, no, no, exactly. Not so lucky. That's and the actually, point, that's right? one of the reasons I chose to actually... Um, take a step aside and, and write the first book, The Music of the Primes, which is about another, well, connected, the Riemann hypothesis. Which, by the way, will be available outside. Uh, yes, actually, yes, I'm sort of, uh, yeah, riding on the back of your coattails. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, my no, no, books this is are great. also available uh, after this as well as uh, your book. But, uh, but uh, it was a little bit to pay back. I mean, my uh, uh, teacher was Mr. Bailson, and uh, I know I wanted to sort of pay him back for um, actually having given me the, this key to this secret garden. And so that's partly why I wrote The Music of the Prize. But I think there was a, you know, I, one of the books he recommended to me was A Mathematician's Apology by yes. G.H. Hardy, a lovely book Beautiful. about the, what, how creative a, an act it is to be a mathematician. Mm -hmm. But actually that book starts with, it is a melancholy experience for a professional mathematician to find himself yes. writing about mathematics. The job of a mathematician is to do mathematics, not to talk about it. And I think but I disagree with him. Yes, uh, okay, good. I disagree right. with him. I mean, he, uh, the book is beautiful, of course, but I think he was exaggerating. And I think this is, this, this is a problem because I think we, I think honestly, we mathematicians, we are kind of an elite. We are an elite and we have to understand this, that we know something which 99.9% .9 of people have no idea even exists. Not, not let alone the details of it. They don't even know it exists. Like I said, 1,000 years worth of essential knowledge in mathematics is a blind spot for everyone. And that's why everyone goes and says, oh, I hate math, or don't talk to me about this stuff, you know, I'm still bad at math. They were bad at painting the fence, and obviously, you know, humiliating by teachers and so on, so it's not their fault. But the point is that we, how can we allow this to continue and to go on? It's a scandal, I mean, really, that we allow this to go on. Why is it that science, other scientists, like biologists and physicists, are out there talking about their stuff, and our stuff is no less important. I, would, I think maybe in some ways it's more important because I think it's, it's at the foundation of everything. It's a universal language like I, you know, we talked about earlier. <laughs> so, but there is this thing that people kind of look, okay, well, Hardy was saying, well, now that I write ab about mathematics, people will say, that's because I cannot do any more mathematics. So, but that's not, that's not the case. But I also think that this, if we start, we should reevaluate ourselves, what we know ab about mathematics to be. I feel like it's almost we work in this gold mine, okay? So we spend the whole day trying to find this gold nugget. And it's hard work, it's super hard, and sometimes we don't find it. We may spend years and years and don't find it. So it's really heartbreaking. And we have to go through a lot of dirt to get to it. So finally when we find it, we are so tired that we don't even have time to look at it and appreciate it and say, wow, this is amazing, let alone go and show it to other people, right? But we have to, because I think when we do that, when we reflect on what we really do, this will help us also to solve problems which we think are unsolvable. Yes, I agree. I mean, I think actually uh, I, 
I thought my experience of writing the music of the primes was going to be um, one which is just going to be helpful for the general public in understanding maths, but actually it helped me understand my own subject in a way that I, right. you know, I had to ask myself questions that I hadn't really considered before in, yeah. in the writing of that. Did that happen with you? Exactly. Has exactly it changed your perspective on the problems that you're working on? Yes, it changed my perspective on pr problems I work on, but also it changed my perspective on what mathematics is. For example, I. I never really thought deeply about where mathematical ideas and truths and entities and concepts come from. Because, you know, you deal with this stuff on a daily basis. So, of course, then you close books and go to sleep, you know, whatever, have dinner and so on, and you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth and maybe even floss or whatever. And then you, and you start again, right? But you don't have time to, to ask, where is this coming from? Why is it? Um, was Pythagoras, was Pythagoras' theorem uh, invented by Pythagoras? Was it discovered by Pythagoras? So, as I was writing this book, I started to think about this, and I was amazed how fascinating these questions are. And I, we don't think about this enough. And I think we have to, because who else? So we kind of delegated to philosophers. And, you know, I, I respect philosophers. Some of my best friends are philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> and they are doing a great job uh, for us, but we know so much more than them. We have to help them. I mean, in mathematics, not in general. But, you know, because you have to know um, a certain amount of I mean, certain, some people maybe study philosophy of mathematics without knowing, making a point of insisting on not knowing what mathematics is. Perhaps there are such philosophers. But this is not the right approach. I think one, we, one should be informed by mathematics. And I think we should set aside, I think I, I, each of us should set aside 10% of our time to think about these deep philosophical questions. Not uh, why are we here, and you know, what's life about, and so these are too complicated. But let's look at the question, what is mathematics? Let's spend 10% of our time. I think the, the consequences will be tremendous because, first of all, this will help us, I think, also to see more clearly the problems we are working on. You'll see the big picture. Yes, I mean, I think uh, your statement about uh, from Cantor about uh, the freedom of that's mathematics. Right. I mean, there is a lot of freedom, and that's what makes it a creative subject, of course. I but mean, not so random. So some people say, well, every yeah. model, you, you, know, you just choose axioms, and, but that's not how it happens no. either. So that's what is it that we're doing? Why are we f pursuing this and not that? What part of it is intuition? What part of it is solid, based on solid foundations? Yes, and, and it's interesting you're, when you started with the idea of the aliens. I mean, there's a kind of feeling like, yeah, well, some things are probably basic which do communicate across um, cultures and across perhaps um, even the cosmos. Uh, I mean, for example, Carl Sagan uses the primes as his way for an alien culture to, to say hello right. because that surely can't be random, although maybe it was just generated by some you know, right. large unitary ma ma matrix. Right. Like that. Um, but, uh, but actually, on the other hand, the stories we start to tell about these numbers do involve a kind of sense of aesthetics and a sense of that's the right. the miracle of that connection. Now, that's, that's right. a kind of an emotional reaction that you have, right. and that's why you know it's not just math; it's love. That's right. I mean, so that's right. so exactly. Do you think that's an important part? And, and of, that's um, the part. So that's you know, people ask me, what is the connection between love and math? You know, because they say, well, everybody hates you know. So I you know, I joke sometimes. I say you know, math and love are kind of similar because you know. Um, it, it's, it's simple at first, but then it can get awfully complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, more seriously, I actually do believe that these are the two forces which kind of make us human, you know. Like what is it that makes us human? I mean, you start to think about it. I mean, of course, other, we have all various, you know, we love our children, we have, you know, we have to breathe, you know, the, but all of these things, like other animals, for example, also do that. But there is no evidence that aliens can do a language, langu uh, so, uh, sorry, animals can do the language program, or they can maybe count up to five or something. They, but once it gets real mathematics, other any animals cannot do it, as far as we know. So it's something which makes us human, but also mathematical truths are the same for everyone. And this is something, it's such a powerful idea, which I ha must admit, I have been a mathematician all my life. It only dawned on me as I was writing this book that actually all of this, Mathematical theories have no shelf life. You know, in physics, physics is very important, yeah. and, but physical theories change and get updated. Pythagoras' theorem is not going to get updated. It's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's not tomorrow, it's not going to be c cubed, you know? It's still going to be c squared. And so Einstein's relativity theory now is the be our best theory of gravity, but who knows? Maybe someone will come. In yeah, I remember looking at the, you know, the, the model of the That's universe right. in the 80s when we were growing up as students. Uh, you know, it, it is fundamentally. You know, it is the same, and it is the same for everyone. It doesn't matter which culture, which religion, which language we speak, gender, whatever. But it's do you think that's the same. reason that we're a sort of product of our uh, our own success? The education system means that we always start with the Greeks, and so it's a. Uh, and how far can you get? Perhaps um, that's actually 
cause the problems that you mentioned right at the beginning. Yeah, but uh, we have to find the right balance. Like I said, you know, we have to read Homer, but we have to also read modern literature. Mm -hmm. And likewise, we have to uh, appreciate uh, Euclid and Pythagoras, but we should also appreciate Riemann, for example. Yeah. Um, and, and Langlands. Yep, uh, yeah, you know? perhaps we should put Langlands so, in the so school So this, I think, is very important. <laughs> well, I, I, I personally think we should. But, uh, uh, now, the other amazing thing about this is, uh, I mean, as I said, it's a, it's a very personal story of um, how you became a mathematician, but um, there's a very particular sort of document in here which I think is incredibly important, which is your um, experiences growing up um, in Russia and uh, the prejudice you experienced uh, having Jewish ancestry. Um, uh, for me, it was one of the most moving parts of the book, just the battle you had to become a mathematician. Could you tell us a little bit about just what you had to go through in order to be where you are here today? Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, when I was 15, um, I sort of fell in love with mathematics because someone opened the doors uh, for me and I, I saw this beautiful world and I started studying mathematics and I decided that I want to be a mathematician. And so a year later, I, w I applied to Moscow University, <coughs> Mehmat, uh, Mathematics and Mechanics program, which was the only place really to study pure mathematics in Moscow at the time. And I was very excited about this. And so, but uh, there was an obstacle, uh, uh, which I did not expect, which is that I was failed at the entrance exams. Um, and because, and this was a systematic policy at the time, which actually persisted for many years, um, of um, failing and uh, discriminating against uh, applicants, uh, uh, Jewish applicants, by a certain definition. What does it even mean, Jewish? In, not, it was not certainly religious by religion, it was just by, in my case, by my last name. My last name is Jew my father's name, and my father is Jewish. But not religious, but you know, it's just, it was just by ethnicity, by blood. For some reason, that was decided, and uh, a lot of people became, uh, you know, sub were subjected to this. So, um, and I describe in my book this grueling four-hour oral yeah, exam. An extraordinary document, actually, the, the, the time you spend being grilled by these people, you getting all the questions right, and yet they would find uh, a definition of a circle, if you miss just one, literally all the points, the direct points are, yeah, uh, all I the mean, points. it's uh, uh, an amazing uh, yeah. story. No, it's, it, it's interesting, because, see, for me, sometimes I th people tell me sometimes that maybe for you, for me, it was a good thing, because I, I found my own way around this obstacle. So it actually make, hardened me. It made me even, gave me even more resolve. I wanted to become a mathematician. And then they put this wall against, uh, in front of me, so I, scale, I had to scale this. I mean, you literally scale this it. Wall. There's one of you end up um, not at Moscow State University, but uh, the University of it's Oil and Gas. Oil, oil, and, oil gas. and Gas School. Yeah, yeah. Good, um, and there's a wonderful story. In my second week, my classmate came up to me, hey, we're going to Kirillov's course at MGU, the, Ma the Ma Moscow State University. Want to come with us? Kirillov was a famous mathematician. Of course, I wanted to attend his lectures, but I had no idea how, that this would be possible. The grand building of MGU was heavily guarded by police. One needed to have special ID to get in. No worries, my classmate said, we'll scale the fence. That sounded dangerous and exciting, so I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. You know, someone, someone commented, they said, you know, in, in the United States, they, they guard the building to keep students in, you know, in, in, <laughs> in the Soviet Union, they, they tried to keep them out. But yes, that, that happened. We had to scale the fence on the side of the building and go through the kitchen. Now, you eventually ended up um, in America. You got yes. A, 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 now, I went to Russia. I, I'm, I was a PhD student, finished in 89, and I went to conferences in Russia around that period. It was very exciting. The mathematical community in Russia was opening up, and, mm -hmm. and, and Russian mathematics was incredibly strong. That's right. Um, but of course, uh, so many Russian mathematicians left to go to the West. Uh, I mean, what is the state of Russian mathematics um, now in your, in your mind? I mean, is it... Uh... Well, it obviously was depleted. I mean, the, there was a great school, but uh, people were subjected to this kind of discrimination, a lot of people. And, you know, as, as I said, maybe for me it was, in some sense, it helped me because it made me even stronger. And, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, kind of. So I was able to... And, I, and, then, and then I was lucky again because there was a great mathematician, Dmitry Fuchs, who took me under his wing and gave me my first problem, which I solved, and I worked with Boris Fagan, uh, who was my teacher and became my, was, became my long, long time co collaborator. But other students were not so lucky, so this is the problem. So, um, and this is the reason why I write about this, because I don't have a, you know, uh, you know a grudge. Uh, I, I'm fine, I, I did well, you know, I'm okay. But I, what I'm really um, angry about, really, is about how many kids you know, with, with the glimmer in their eyes, 
you know, who wanted to become mathematicians and had, not, had done nothing wrong just because they had a Jewish name or they came from a Jewish family. They were so uh, unfairly, you know, discriminated against, and they were, many of them were destroyed. They were, there was just such a horrible experience that they couldn't have, could never quite recover from. So I want people to know about this. That's that's the first thing. So now, luckily now, as far as I know, in in Russia, in today's Russia, this is not happening. So, uh, but maybe nobody. But now, a talented a youth wants to go abroad, wants to go to other countries. And many of the mathematicians left. There are still some who, who remain, and this is wonderful because, of course, in, in Russia there's a very deeply rooted tradition of mathematics. And I hope, I would like to go one day and also give, teach a class and, and help uh, stu students there and so on. So I think it will come back, it will rebound, but for now it's sort of a, a kind of on the low, so on the low side of the, of the, of the, of the wave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it is an amazing testament of that period in history and also a wonderful story of a great uh, mathematical story as well. So um, anyway, I'd like to uh, open uh, up for questions uh, from the audience um, for Edward um, about maths, love, politics, um, anything <laughs> that uh, uh, you'd like to ask. So hands up and we'll... Or we can ask Marcus also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I'm just going to repeat the question to everyone. Uh, so it's a, teacher, a, a question from a maths teacher who's feeling a little bit of embarrassed about the fact that she has to teach um, all of this rather boring stuff, which I think is actually the government's fault, not yours. Um, uh, but yeah, so what should she be teaching to her students when she goes in tomorrow morning? Very good, so... Yes, but, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and send it to Michael Gove. Yeah. <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to clarify something that sometimes people think when I say that people think that I'm blaming the teachers, but I'm not I'm not blaming the teachers. I blame myself. I blame other mathematicians for not doing enough to educate, to help teachers, to give teachers the, the right tools so that they, you know, because they may, they are not given, I don't know about how it is in the United, in the, in the United Kingdom, but I know better about the United States. In the United States, teachers are put in a very difficult position because the rules are constantly changing, there are different testing systems and so on introduced, and they're like, oh my gosh, and today is this, tomorrow is that. They don't have time even to think about this, what is the material, and they're not given enough. Textbooks are awful and so on and so forth. So it's not going to happen overnight. So we're not going to solve it overnight because this is, this is, a, product. This is, this is a product of something which has been going on for, for centuries, I would say, but certainly for decades. And so what I think we should do really is just little, little steps. We, make, we all make small steps. Um, we mathematicians make small steps in spending some time thinking about what is it that we're doing and maybe we should tell others what it is. Um, you know, parents maybe should learn also about mathematics and kind of become aware of what their children are missing because I think what's going to happen is going to be uh, solved by a kind of popular uprising. Right now, maybe there is 0.01% or 0.1% of people who know what mathematics is about. What if it's 10%? Then they say, okay, maybe I don't know this stuff, but I want my children to know this stuff. Then there will be enough people to go and affect the change. That's what I think we should do. And likewise with teachers, I, you know, I hate to say anything because I just, I have such a respect and admiration for a profession of a teacher and I know how difficult it is. So I, and I certainly don't have the solution. I don't have a solution. If anything, I would like to learn from teachers about what I should do to help, you know, but, but obviously, first of all, it's not bad stuff. You know, Euclid is Euclid, you know, it's not, like I said, mathematics um, has no shelf life. He, his book, Elements, is just as important and just as alive today as it was 2,300 years ago. So there's nothing wrong in teaching that. What I'm saying is we should diversify. We should also talk about some of the stuff which, came, which happened recently. Okay, so in other words, it's okay to teach that. The good thing, important thing is to teach it as not through memorization and not through just solving, solving problems and it's all set in stone, but to teach it as a live organism, as a struggle of ideas, that these things were not clear you know, to people who were developing them, right? But also now there are resources, there are books. I mean, you have two authors <laughs> in front of you, right? But also, I mentioned Numberphile. Numberphile is a great resource. You can, one can go and uh, kids love it. I know, you know from uh, Brady Heron, who is the one who, uh, the, 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 you know, the producer of this channel, um, that he gets lots of emails from kids. And I, I got some because I did a few videos with him. So it's, they're all short, most of them under 10 minutes, and describe some concept of mathematics. and. The, the point is that this is a portal. You cannot explain everything in 10 minutes. But it, it will, maybe it will uh, spur some, you know, some interest. So you could say, oh wow, this is, for example, there was one video which many of you may have seen about the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. And of course, there was a lot of criticism about how it was explained and so on. But I think it's wonderful that there is this idea that you can sum up all the positive integers 
And it's not in, in, in there is a certain context in which this sum, there is a regularized way to sum, sum them up, so that the answer is minus one over 12 and not infinity. Nobody, most people have never heard of this. So this is such a great, you know, for a kid, I think, to appreciate, to see, wow, there, that's what, there is this in mathematics? Wow, so in other words, that would be something, maybe if you have like five minutes in your class left or something, which I know is difficult, but to, to show them something like this, I think could go a long way. All right. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, question from a mathematical philosopher who you insulted earlier. So I'm just going to repeat the questions and make sure everyone's... Uh, so, um, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, we had a lot of mathematicians who were deeply interested in philosophy. Um, why, why is that not the case now, do you think? Because we are abdicating, you know, our responsibilities. We are not doing our job. I mean, that's what I think. I mean, those people, the greats, you know, like Hilbert and Gödel, they were... Uh, uh, connected to philosophy. They understood that it was, it was important. But of course, they were, I mean, one could say that because they had this enterprise of finding sort of rigorous axiomatic system and bu building this beautiful edifice of mathematics from scratch, and that didn't work out. So I think what happened is that then people were kind of disappointed and it, it was kind of a little bitter. And then they said, you know what? The kind of, it was a backlash against that. They said, you know what, let's not waste time on this. Let's just solve, I want to solve a cubic equation. Let's just solve the cubic equation. Let other, other people worry about this. I think that's what happened. But, you know, look, I mean, this is not going to be solved overnight, but this is important. We have to, we have to work on this. We have to understand what is this all about. We would like to understand, I hope, what this is all about, what the world is about, what's really going on. And I think mathematics is, a, is one of the important pieces of the puzzle. And one where we can actually analyze things rigorously. So, in other words, absolutely a great point that um, mathematicians are not doing this enough. And there are some reasons for this, but I think there's a kind of bogus reasons. We should really kind of, you know, we're putting be, our head in be the tough, sand, be tough, and, and, and hmm? we're putting our head in the sand. After putting our hand in the sand. That's what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will repeat the question. Repeat the question. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, yes. Apparently, we're not very good at uh, love mathematicians, and um, but you know, th uh, you know, a third of new marriages are decided by algorithms. So you know, it, how can we actually use our mathematical tools to increase the gene pool? Oh, right. That's the uh, <laughs> dangerous. Um, well, I think that question. first of all, about mathematicians Over not to you, Edward. not. N not being good lovers, I think it's a misconception. Uh, yes, and, 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 and I do there recommend. There are examples. I do yeah. recommend, in addition to this book, um, looking at uh, the extraordinary um, film that uh, Edwards made, which is called Rights of Love and Math. I think, which um, uh, will, will yes. Just had a pre question. UK premiere uh, in London. Yes, UK premiere in, in three London. Three days exactly. Three yeah. days ago. But uh, it's before the ten o'clock watershed, so we couldn't show a clip um, here. <laughs> so, but. Yeah, so I think that, but this is a very important point, first of all, that you're making about algorithms running our lives. And it's not just about, you know, the dating sites, but even more mundane things like buying books and renting videos and movies and so on, right? So, and I think that's one of the things where, when I talk about this, people find this as, as kind of a compelling argument, why we should know something about math, because, look, I mean, the whole, everything gets more and more defined by mathematics. So, and I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but this is, a, this is a fact. It is happening, and we have to be aware. And someone, you know, someone said to me, but, you know, why, why are you advocating that people should know about mathematics? For example, we fly on airplanes, right? But we don't know how to fly airplanes. So we use it, but we let others do it for us. Why should it be different for mathematics? And my point is that it's not about learning how to fly an airplane. It's about knowing that we are on the airplane. Yes. You know, so that's what it is. It's just that knowing where we are, being aware of what's going on. And this algorithm thing that you mentioned is, of course, huge. But, you know, of course, since my book is called Love and Math, some people take it as an indication that maybe I have a formula, a secret formula in the book for finding a perfect partner or for finding love. But that's not the case. And I actually, I don't believe that there is a formula which would describe love. Um, there could be a formula to, for matching, you know, things and so on, but... Uh, and th this is just as, you know, you meet somebody, it used to be that you meet somebody randomly or maybe you meet somebody through your friends, and now you meet it through an algorithm. So in some sense, it's, it's all in the same category. It's not that different. But I think, uh, what, so my point rather is not, is not that math can describe lo love, but it's rather that there is some love built into math a priori, because, like I said earlier, because the mathematical truths are universal truth, timeless universal truths, which belong to all of us. 
And so, you know, in principle, if I meet somebody that I never met before, and I don't know who they are, where they come from, they may not even speak the same language as I speak. So what is, there that, what is it that we have in common? Well, the, the whole body of mathematics that has been discovered up to now yeah. belongs to all of us, to both of us, or to all of us. And it's the same. So it's something that, you know, we can hold on to. I think that was my experience going to Russia because uh, I remember going to this conference in the middle of Siberia and there was nobody who spoke English. But actually we were able to communicate and we shared our stories uh, um, and it That's was right. an amazing experience. Uh, I think we've got time for one last question which was the, the woman um, here. Yeah, yeah I think so there's the question about um, the, the ethical uses of mathematics and it's interesting because at the moment there's quite a debate in Britain about uh, should mathematicians be working with GCHQ, our NSA? Um, That's right. So uh, do you think that it's important that mathematicians should think about the ethical side of what? Very important question. So, you know, and there is a, uh, there is a recent pre uh, precedent. Physicists who were driven purely by theoretical, you know, uh, uh, pursuit, wanted to understand, you know, how elementary park, how the world worked and atoms and so on, just stumbled upon nuclear energy. And then, you know, so th the result, this monstrous thing was created, the nuclear bomb. And they actually had to deal with this. And they did. And they were, you know, some of the greatest physicists, like Bohr and Einstein and so on, they understood their responsibility that they have to try to, you know, keep it from destroying the world. And I think, but I think we mathematicians are now in the same position. But we are kind of behind the curve on this, I think. And my point, but my point is, so there is a debate, like you said, about NSA and um, GCHQ here in, in, in Britain. And some people have suggested that we severe ties, for example, in the United States with NSA. And we kind of boycott them. Boycott the uh, NSA, but I think it's actually op the opposite. My feeling is that it should be the opposite because my impression is, my guess is that the reason why this kind of things happened were apparently, according to the reports, that um, weaknesses were deliberately introduced into widely used encryption algorithms, which is really is like poisoning the well, because you know, so you're trying to achieve a particular objective, but in the meantime you're creating you know, a very bad situation for everyone, and nobody is aware of this. So I think that people who are dec the decision makers, they may not have fully understood what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me also, I think, the parallel, I, I'd like to make a parallel to the economic crisis, the global economic crisis, because I think it's the same mechanism at play, where you have mathematicians, in the case of economic crisis, they're called quants, you know, these mathematicians who create those models, but they were not the decision makers. It was other people, on Wall Street and so forth, who apparently many of them were not really aware of what's going on. But then when it happened, when these models were misused, they, were not, they did not weigh the risk and to the benefit and so on, right? And didn't understand, but they used them anyway. And when it happened, they blamed the quants and said, oh, it's mathematicians' fault because they created these models. But mathematicians were not responsible for the decision making. And likewise, I think, in a, uh, security uh, situation with NSA and so on. I would like to know whether people who make the decisions were actually fully aware of what was going on. And that's why I think our role rather would be to, to help and advise. Step and up to the plate. That's and right, and help and maybe help people who are the yeah. decision makers to explain what are the consequences. Yeah. So that they take it more seriously and maybe that way we could avoid. But either way, I think it, we are facing some very serious ethical issues here right now. And we have to, so in a, uh, philosophical questions are important, but perhaps these ethical questions are even more important. So I, I completely agree with you. Well, thank you so much, Edward, for sharing your love affair with maths. And uh, let's give Edward a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.